serial killers. Nations become glued to their televisions or news feeds when just the suspicion of a serial killer roams in their midst. Serial killers have taken the place of werewolves, witches, and vampires in the popular mind. If a current news story began with werewolf sighted in local schoolyard, only the most gullible and ignorant of us would believe that an actual werewolf was around. However, change that announcement to serial killer scene on local schoolyard, and we have both a completely different story and perhaps mass panic. Today, we have mass media on a level not even imagined 20 years ago. Social media and the internet, as well as more traditional media like TV, radio, and newspapers, add to the information overload. Sometimes it seems that there is news of a serial killer somewhere in the world at any one given time. We should say that we distinguish serial killers from mass killers, who kill many people in one singular event. We are not speaking about killings carried out in the name of governments, no matter how evil, such as Nazi Germany or 1970s Cambodia's killing fields. If you are a person who likes these types of dark topics and other events from history, please like this video and subscribe to our channel. The term serial killer has only been used since the late 1800s, and the term was used to describe the infamous and still unknown Jack the Ripper of Victorian England. By the way, in 2019, an investigation that included DNA analysis was done on the still existing evidence of Jack's crimes and revealed the killer to be a Polish immigrant named Aaron Kaminsky, a barber in his 20s. There are still some doubts about this conclusion, but to date, this investigation has been the most scientifically thorough. Since the 1950s, the term serial killers has been widely used as it has become a more psychological definition of what we know as the characteristics of modern-day serial killers. They usually begin by torturing and killing animals, then move towards torturing other children, and once the pleasure from others' pain is fully realized, the killer also comes to the conclusion that the ultimate pleasure will come from the death of another person. This is a very general description. There is variation and the pleasure derived might or might not be of a sexual or psychosexual nature. But, for example, the killing of multiple women might represent a vengeance fantasy against a long-dead mother, and this fantasy induces pleasure. Unfortunately, that pleasure fades, and the need for it grows again, despite perhaps a short-lived but intense period of guilt or worry over being discovered. Soon, the murderer must kill again. In ancient times, and for the purposes of this video we mean any time before the 1500s, there were likely just as many serial killers as there are now, and perhaps more. Think about it. Human nature and mental illness have not changed that much since ancient times. If anything, our ability to recognize and treat serious mental illness has grown exponentially since the time when a person talking to himself was treated as a witch or instrument of the devil, though in some quarters these types of beliefs linger today. Many, not all, modern serial killers have been diagnosed with one form or another of schizophrenia, in which one may hear voices usually telling a person to do something out of the norm. It should be said, however, not all schizophrenics are serial killers, and not all serial killers are schizophrenics. Persons diagnosed with schizophrenia, which used to be more commonly called split personality, can easily lead productive and happy lives, provided they receive proper treatment. It should also be remembered that schizophrenia is not multiple personality disorder, which is much rarer and usually does not exhibit physical violence, and if so, is usually in the form of relatively short outbursts that are suppressed by other aspects of the individual personality. In actuality, in relatively modern times, the widespread inculcation of moral values via school and religion, the advent of public education, mass media, and lately of DNA science, and what is fast becoming a surveillance society of cameras everywhere, had likely lessened the number of serial killings. Imagine a time when none of that existed, and when the upper class did not only live better, more luxurious lives in many places and at many times, but that they could kill with impunity. The ancient serial killers we have more knowledge about are those in the very upper and ruling classes. For instance, take the case of Prince Liu Pengli of Han Dynasty China, who lived between 144 and 116 BC. Liu was the grandson of Chinese Emperor Wen, a man with absolute power in his kingdom. Wen could order the death of virtually anyone and would be immune from justice, because 
he was justice. Wen, however, was not a psychopath, and his rule was based on Confucian ideals which prescribed such behavior. The emperor knew that killing innocents for no reason would likely contribute, perhaps only in a small way, to his dynasties losing the mandate of heaven, the belief held until the 20th century which had it that gods could bless or curse the rule of a dynasty, and serial killing might be seen as the incarnation of a god's cursing a dynasty or a people, sooner or later replacing it with another. Emperor Wen's grandson had no such compunction. As governor of his own fiefdom called Zhidong, Liu Peng had absolute power and absolute immunity, at least for a time. Liu is history's first detailed account of a serial killer. It seems the prince, along with a number of his men and slaves, would flush people in hiding out and, on a whim, ride out at night and terrorize his peasants, likely killing hundreds for years. It's also likely that he didn't just kill at night, and his killing was done not only by his men, but by Liu himself and likely included more horrifying ways to go than just a sword to the heart. Disembowelment, strangulation, skinning a person alive, and quartering were all forms of torture and execution at the time. Liu was only stopped when a brave soul, likely one of the local upper class, made it to the emperor's court and denounced Liu, which caused an investigation. Even then, the emperor could not bring himself to kill his grandson, only to strip him of his noble titles and cast him out of the royal family. Liu was sent to a neighboring province, and there the historical record ends. One of the most interesting serial killers was Gilles de Rez of France. Gilles de Rez is estimated to have killed 100 to 200 people, mostly young men, some of whom were sexually abused. Interestingly enough, de Rez was a nobleman who fought with the famed heroine of France, Joan of Arc. It is rumored that de Rez, knowing that as a convicted heretic who was burned at the stake, Joan was in hell and sought to carry out his murders in the most heinous ways possible so that he might spend eternity with his beloved. Ironically, Joan of Arc was convicted in a kangaroo court and is now the patron saint of France, so unfortunately for Gilles, he burns alone. Peter Niers and Christian Knipper Tenga were serial killers in Germany in the 1500s, outside the scope of this video, but they were perhaps the most disgusting and prolific killers respectively of olden times. Niers was reported to have eaten many of his young victims. Knipper Tenga purportedly kept a diary in which he accounted for 950 murders. Perhaps the most infamous serial killer in the period covered by this video is Vlad the Impaler, Think of how evil one must be to be the person on which the famous 1897 novel Dracula by Bram Stoker was based. Vlad, like others mentioned here, was in the ruling class and governed much of the region of Transylvania, which today lies within Romania. Yes, you heard that right, Transylvania is an actual place, and one of the reasons it's associated with evil is due to both Dracula, of course, and Vlad the Impaler whose real name was Vlad Draculia and was known as Vlad Tepes. Vlad was the son of a local lord, whose last name does not mean vampire, but dragon. Vlad's father and older brother were assassinated by a local rival while he was away. Upon his return, Vlad engaged in an on-again and off-again eight-year struggle to reclaim his birthright. Was Vlad a serial killer as we know them today? Perhaps not, but we do know that he killed or had killed perhaps thousands of people. Not only were the soldiers of his enemies killed, but those villagers that Vlad deemed to have aided them. It seems impossible, considering that Vlad's chosen method of execution was impalement, that he did not derive pleasure from the act. Impalement was a relatively common form of execution in ancient times and was usually reserved for those who had committed particularly heinous crimes or had rebelled against a local lord. Though there were variations in method, it's generally accepted that Vlad had his victims placed on top of a pole through a bodily orifice. The victims were held in place by straps. Slowly, their body weight would cause the stake to drive deeper and deeper into their bodies. This could take hours or perhaps a day or more. On occasion, Vlad had his victims placed on the crest of hills surrounding villages as both a warning and a promise. Vlad did not drink blood, that we know of. That was a local folktale brought to life by Bram Stoker in his novel. In ancient times, people moved from one area to another without being monitored. The culture of the time was highly dismissive of the lives of the lower classes. Law enforcement barely existed, and when it did, it took the form of soldiers, most likely oppressing rebellious peasants. 
there was no CSI or forensic science. Given all of this, most serial killers of ancient times are both unknown and were likely never caught.